Welcome in to another crossover episode of George in the Jungle and the Nightcap, where we do this one last time to finish discussing the Cincinnati Bearcats basketball season. Uh, George in the Jungle is brought to you by Remington Tavern. Remington Tavern is located at 8892 Glendale Milford Road, 45140, where they have daily happy hours from 3 to 7 p.m., $5 Woodford Wednesdays. You can find them on Instagram at RemyTavCincy, that's R-E-M-I-T-A-V, Cincy with a Y, or you can follow them on Facebook. It's also brought to you by Galactic Fried Chicken. Galactic Fried Chicken is found in Dayton, Kentucky, right over the river. Uh, you can order at www.galacticfriedchicken.com. They will deliver pretty much anywhere inside the 275 loop. Be sure to tell them, pump it up when you pick up your galactic goodness. Save yourself 15%. Make sure you check out that sauce. Galactic Fried Chicken out of this world. All right, George. It was um, it was certainly an evening. Yeah, it was a great game. It was a lot of fun to watch. Um, you know, I, disappointing, no doubt about it. Um, I'll say this. Indiana State is a good team, by the way, to the Bearcats in the season, and it's over and all that fun stuff. Um, sure. Indiana State, obviously, 30 wins coming into this game. Anytime you win 30, I don't care who you are, where you play what level you're at, it's a hell of a season, and, and it sets up about your team that you're darn good, and Indiana State was darn good. Um, all that being said, and, and from the announcers, I thought UC was playing the 1976 undefeated Indiana Hoosiers. I mean, my God. <laughs> well, they were just a little over the top about how great this team is and the offensive run, and look, a lot of it's justified. It really is. Um, and really good team, really good season. But seriously, as a guy who's followed UC for a long time, you never, ever, ever, ever accept a loss to Indiana State in men's basketball. You just don't. I don't care if Larry Bird's on the team or Larry Nerd, who we saw tonight. I don't care. <laughs> you do not lose to Indiana State in men's basketball. Or as a UC alum, a UC fan, a uh, UC follower, a UC student, you're hacked off. And I'm a little hacked off about it. But, uh, you know, they had a chance. They had to leave. A little over an hour ago, I was, you know, these beers were tasting a little better with that seven-point lead, eight-point lead in the second half. But, um, you know, the, now yet, now the you just have to think on that. Bandago and the technical foul made a huge difference in that game. Not blaming refs at all. UC should not lose to Indiana State. And, uh, you know, they had their chances at the end, made a comeback, couldn't make anything happen in the last couple of minutes. And for some reason, right when I'm thinking I'm going to praise the defense after the game, the defense just kind of disappears. You said that the, the beers were tasting better about an hour ago. Well, now you have to think that every Cincy light that you drink goes to helping this team out next year in the, in the portal. So... Maybe maybe drink an extra couple tonight. Right. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to finish my allotment. <laughs> Put it that way. And I saw the chat about turnovers, too, and that's something. UC had three turnovers at the half. Two by skillings that were like in the first minute of the game, right? And then I think Jizzle had one somewhere in the first half. Um, Ten in the second half. And when it mattered, and it's uh, they went through one stretch, gosh, I wrote it down, where they just started turning it over. Yeah, they were up seven. Uh, then Indiana State goes on a big run, and you see, I don't know how many turnovers they had during that run, uh, whether it was a silly pass in the half court or a silly pass on the run. Um, they turned it over too much in that second half and, and doing it in that stretch where they could have put the game not on ice, but they would have been in great shape on the road. It's never over on the road, but they would have been in damn good shape, but instead it went the other way because they were turning the ball over. 
Yeah, the, the turnovers were a weird thing in the second half. Um, it, it just felt like it, it got to the point, though, where I I have never, from, from pretty much the beginning of this season until now, George, I've never been more confused on anything in sports than what a foul is. I have no clue what a foul is. Even when Cincinnati was actively trying to foul in the last minute of this game, they couldn't actually get a foul called on them. I don't know at this point what a foul is, what a foul isn't. I got to the point where I'm screaming at the TV where they should actually shoulder check people, but then you probably are getting an, an, a flagrant foul, but they weren't getting fat called on the ticky tack stuff in the last minute, the, the same stuff that they were getting called on the rest of the entire game. I have no idea at this point what a foul is, what you're supposed to do when you want to intentionally foul somebody, what you're supposed to be doing when you're just defending somebody. Apparently, if you're an out of shape white guy, you can actually not have to put your both hands up to just get a jump ball. I don't know what a foul is anymore, George. Yeah, and then on that other run, I, I think the that one where the tie-up was, I think it was in the first half. In the second half, there was another one on the run, and I think it was Jizzle looking for the contact. And it may have been blocked. Um, I can't remember exactly what happened on the play, but obviously the ball didn't go in the bucket. But I thought he got the body. And then they do the replay, and the announcers are like, well, yeah, he didn't get him with the hands. No, but he's got 260 pounds that he used with the butt. But, again, that's not what it came down to. I know what you're saying, and there are inconsistencies. But, uh, you know, this one's on the Bearcats. You can't blow that lead in the second half and start turning it over. And then, uh, God, every time I thought they had it figured out. No, it's not. It, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. and I, That's not on the Bearcats. You cannot – do what they did in that it's a it's a 10 second stretch of game the officials changed the entire game aziz gets shoved in the back on a dunk clearly like that is a seven foot two alien going up to dunk the ball. Go on the all of a sudden goes flying that's a foul they get three points off of it because cincinnati is out of position because they fouled and then, and then you get a technical on Wes Miller. That's a seven-point swing in a game that was a two-point game with with three seconds left, George. And, and then they come back and tie it up and then start atrocious. kicking it around. No, okay, they come back the and tie it up and start kicking atrocious. it around. It was terrible. The last two – you want terrible? The last two minutes of the UC offense. That was terrible. Uh, how about – Indiana State scored one field goal in seven minutes and 18 seconds. One field goal in seven minutes and 18 seconds to close the game. The Cincinnati defense did what they should have done to close the game. The Indiana State wasn't taking those turnovers and turning them into points. Did, did Indiana State score 85 freaking points? That's okay, not yeah, on the, the defense wasn't great in the second half against a That's great on the offensive team. The, the well, Indiana the State rack. scored 85 points because they made eight threes in like three minutes at the start of the second half. Some of that, of course, on Cincinnati. Yeah. But but all momentum was was given to the home team, handed well, to the home team by terrible officiating. Go back and watch. Every rebound, Cincinnati was shoved in the back. Every rebound, Cincinnati was shoved in the back. No call. They didn't call one over the back, or shove on Indiana uh, State on the defensive glass. They did it every time. And if I was them, I would have too because the officials weren't calling it. Jesse well, James got shoved in the back on his last layup attempt. The ultimate, on the, foul calls, the ultimate foul calls were pretty even in my book. and that, that doesn't make the officiating good if it should have been I didn't say seven fouls good. to 15. I didn't say it was good. It may not have been good in one game this year, to be honest with you. But at some point, when you're playing Indiana State, you got to beat Indiana State. And you don't give sure. up 85 points and beat Indiana State. You can't beat them if they are allowed to foul you on every trip and nothing is called. All right. Well, we're going to – that's fine. You can hang it on the refs. I'll hang it on the Bearcats. I generally don't hang it on the refs. They were moving screens the entire game. There were not moving called. There were <laughs> on, that, on that note, on, on the moving screens note, I love Fran's breakdown where he was like, Dan's trying to figure out if he should go over or under. Well, of course he can't go anywhere. The dude 
Dude's holding both of his arms. <laughs> wow. He couldn't go anywhere. I, I get it, George. I get it. The defense wasn't good enough in the second half. They had too many turnovers in the second half. But they were still clearly the better team, and they were not allowed to compete like they should have competed oh, at the I end of that game. The team. I'll, I, I will agree they are the better team. They got hosed. The fix was in. It doesn't feel as bad as the Paul NIT game back in 19-whatever it was, 91. <laughs> it doesn't feel that bad. That was a complete what I got yesterday, colonoscopy. But, I mean, look, give credit to Indiana State. That offense is fantastic. Like, I, I know we want to criticize the defense, but how do you defend them if they make every three and then they back cut because they're closing out? Because you're you're playing sound defense on a team that shoots the three extremely well, and then they back cut you, and then what do you do? Like how do you how do you properly defend that, George? When they are making at one point in the second half, they were making eighty three percent of their. I think they were five of six or six and seven or whatever it was. Some of that I agree is on Cincinnati not defending well where they were open for threes, but then they play off of that and they start back cutting you and you're pulled out as he isn't allowed to be anywhere near the rim because Avila uh, can stretch you and hit threes. But did. yes, for the thir first 13 minutes of the second half, the defense was atrocious. They made one field goal in the final seven minutes and 18 seconds. The defense was outstanding. I thought it was really in those good. final of seven minutes. I do. I don't think the offense was very good in the last few minutes. And Cincinnati scored 81. If your excuse is there, if your reasoning is you can't let them score 85, Cincinnati still put 81 on the board. 81 Their should be a was, They scored 1.175 points per possession. That is very, very good offense. That should be enough to win. You're right. Watching this That's game all. felt like what? Watching this game felt like watching. LeBron James felt like watching Shaq felt like watching any of these name, whatever big man you want, where they don't get the calls simply because they are bigger, faster, more athletic than Indiana state was. And I think that was probably the most frustrating thing for me was it, it just resembled watching that type of a performance. I mean, Fran, I love Fran. Fran's a good dude. I, I like Fran. He's talking about verticality with Avila when he's like this. He did Superman. And like, the, one, and the one play you're talking about, I thought he got him with the body too. I think he did. Good. He got him up top and with the body. And then he got him again at the end on Jizzle's drive like this. And Fran's talking about verticality. He couldn't get vertical. I thought my joke was funny. He couldn't get vertical if they put 10 Big Macs on a platform above him. He couldn't get his arms up like that. I don't know. You might be wrong on that. You might be wrong. Did you see him do this all night? He didn't do this all night. I don't think his arms can go straight. That's my point. He couldn't get <laughs> to 10 Big Macs on a platform above him because he can't get his arms vertical. <laughs> well... Does Simas foul at the end being on the floor? Simas did the exact thing you should do there. He caught the ball and went into his shooting motion. That is a three-point shooting foul, George. Technically, yes, they never call it that way, though. I don't know why they should, but they never call it that way. It's, it's a shooting foul. It is a yeah. like, like, see, if you're smart enough to catch it and go straight into your motion, that is a shooting foul. I just, he, almost, he almost made the shot. He did. It almost went in. Can you imagine if that went in and they called it and he gets four? Um, I just, I'm front, like, officiating should not. Here's, here's the real thing, George. That was a great game. A great game. Two teams playing at an insanely high level. Officiating should not be what we're talking about. If I didn't think it was a big deal, I wouldn't care. Like, I, I would say, kudos to Indiana State. They played great. They made shots. They made tough shots. 
they won the game. Hats off to them. But I feel like that's what happened. I feel like Cincinnati was not officiated evenly with Indiana State. When you see guys going up the rebounds and they just do this and they're out of the screen, how is that not a push? Like how how are those things not called? How is it not officiated evenly? And like I said, if I was Indiana State, I would have done the same thing. If I'm allowed to shove Cincinnati in the back on every rebound with no calls, I'd be in the huddle like shove the shit out of them because the refs aren't calling it. I don't know. I just never use that crutch. And maybe, you know, maybe that's a fault of mine. That's fine. But I felt like even when the game was tied late, you got your chance. And you either do it or you don't. Sure. And you see didn't. Sure. I, I get that. And I'm generally right there with you, George. I'm generally, like, I'll complain about the officiating during the game. But as soon as the game ends, it is what it is. You got to figure out a way to win the game. I just thought it was egregious. I, I just thought it was it was officiated. The only word I can use to describe is unfairly. I thought Indiana State was allowed to do things that Cincinnati wasn't for the entirety of 40 minutes. And I don't, I, like, that deserves to be called out. You don't just get to be a bad official. And then it, you know, we just, it, eh, they're bad officials, but I Cincinnati agree. should have to be held accountable. Without they're not. It's like everybody else. That's my job. Goes to hell. That's my job. <laughs> yeah, well, you need to be the commish. I should call the game equal, call the game fair, and I have no problem. I, there have been many times, George, where people are like Aaron and I went through this a couple weeks ago, where another uh, another team shot thirty free throws and Cincinnati shot eighteen or eight. whatever, eight eight. eight. Okay, don't foul. I thought they fouled too much that game. I didn't put that on the officials because Cincinnati fouled four three-point shooters. Right. Cincinnati put themselves in a position to make their mistakes cost them the game. I don't feel like the way that was officiated, Cincinnati was making mistakes and the officials were calling it right. I guess that's my point. I feel like it was called incorrectly for most of the game. And that's frustrating with your season on the line. I guess that's, that's, I'll leave it there. Cause I don't want to turn this into a, you know, an hour rant on the officials, but I, I just feel like oh, and there's, the game there's... was not called fairly at all. Well, then let's get to your next favorite subject. Is Jizzle James cemented himself as the <laughs> starter next season after two games over 20? Um, Maybe. Maybe because I thought his defense I'm, was still questionable tonight. If I'm Jizzle James and I am in my exit interview, I'm looking at Wes Miller dead in his eyes, looking into his soul and telling him, I need you to promise me that I can be the starter next year. I've done everything you've asked of me. And I would tell you to enjoy the transfer report. Well, that's where we differ. If you're if you if you're a player that's going to tell the coach that, bye. See ya. As great as he can be, that you don't have that kind of juice, Aaron. That's a ridiculous thing to say. I disagree. Win the job. Go through the summer. I think go through think the all just, season and win the job. I don't I don't see how he can do any more than what he's just done to win the job. I think he'll see a lot more playing time next year. Absolutely. Uh, right. Of course he will. And he should. Um whether or not now you know demand starting all that stuff, I don't even know that he would do that. I hope he wouldn't. Um, I hope he would understand the performance he put together in this game and the last game and playing however many minutes he played with a minimal amount of turnovers um, and leading the team the way he did offensively. I think um, he he should know in his mind where he's at. I'm sure right. West lets him know where he's at in this program. And so I don't think he has to worry about playing time. Kevin, I'm saying, if Jizzle, and Jizzle will not do this, if Jizzle walked into the exit interview and said, if you don't name me the starter for next season right now, I'm going to enter the transfer portal, every coach in the country is going to say, good luck in the transfer portal. Nobody is guaranteed anything. Come back, continue to work, continue to get better, and if you're the best option, you'll start. And guess what? 
He's the best option. There's a reality that he could start right next to Day Day Thomas next year. Sure. Because he can score in bunches and bunches and bunches. So, I mean, yeah, but but he's not going to do that. So that's just a comment on if any player does that to a coach, the coach is going to tell you, it's been nice working with you. I hope you enjoy your next day. That's not how the, – the, the, the rabbit doesn't have the gun, Aaron. Well, I'm just – I believe – 1,000% that he is the best option. Okay. Keep working your ass off. Get to the start of the next season. If you're the best option, you'll start. Maybe it's next to Day-Day. Maybe it's instead of Day-Day. Uh, what they have shown, I think, and in, in, interestingly enough, is that they might not need – Here, here's the conversation that really should be happening right now, Aaron. They might not need that alpha combo guard. What they might need is help behind this Jizzle and Day Day, where they are the two starters at the one and the two, and Potential, you need yeah. to to fill in behind them. I think we're at. What did we talk about when the Jizzle argument came up at the beginning of the season? I want to see them play more together. They were doing that and getting really good at it. So towards the end of the season, yeah, Absolutely. yeah, maybe more maybe, under did a good job. Look, Maybe I, they I just asked the question spend. to stir the pot when when you're already at, at this level. I, I, I just I want to see if I, I can keep pushing you at that level. <laughs> <laughs> but it's usually maybe, the other way around. Here's the thing. Maybe you don't have to go out and spend seven hundred thousand dollars to get a combo a, an elite combo guard in the portal. Maybe you have yeah, it. Just need a you just need a backup. Maybe you have it. Maybe he's he's already right there in front of you. And guess what? At the two. You can hide a guy a little bit more defensively. Where Day Day is the guy guarding the ball and Jizzle is the guy, you know, not getting stuck in a million ball screens and stuff that he's not yet comfortable with. I think that's an interesting conversation to have, and I'm sure we'll have as we get into this. I'm going to calm down and let you two talk. That option is open based on what we've seen. That option. Absolutely. And, and not only is it just an option, it may be a strength. Play it may be what it may be the smart. You might. Uh, here's the thing, George. Do you feel com comfortable they could go out and find a combo guard guard scorer in the portal better than Jizzle James? No. So there's there's maybe uh, your answer right there, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, yeah. So however they do it, whatever they do, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that kid, provided he sticks in town, and I think he will. I don't see any reason for, why he wouldn't. If you're searching for continuity on this team, too, and trying to build upon what you already had, truthfully, that's going to be your best option. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess, uh, George, this was this was probably my favorite CMOS game out of all of them. Tough to beat all San Francisco, two. but uh, tough. <laughs> Tough to beat that San Francisco game for me with that shot he made at I the get end it. of that. Um, West Virginia? That was a hell of a run he had in that game, too. Like that one. Didn't like being down 16 in the second half. But you come back and win, you forget about that, right? Uh, <laughs> but, um, look, he played really, really well down the stretch. And, and once he got, like, healthier – you know, it's easy to forget he got hit by a car back in December. Um, once he got healthier and, and really got into the flow as the season went on, he was playing better and better and better. And certainly an argument could be made, played his best in the postseason. Yeah, uh, he just got to the point, as as the, the last month has really gone on, got to the point where, Anytime he shot the ball, even when he was shooting from the logo, which drives me insane when he shoots from the logo. But even tonight, he made one from beyond, well beyond NBA range. Um, the the bank the was open. The yeah. logo, he made one. The 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 bank was open tonight for CMOS. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. I don't know. It was just. I thought he played well. Off. Offensively and defensively. He was rebounding. He was doing things. He was getting around screens better than I feel like he's done all season long. 
and it just seemed like probably both ways his most complete game to where I felt just super comfortable with him everywhere on the court, which I don't know that I could say that, especially early on in the in the Big 12 slate. And of course, we're going to attribute it to the fact that he's playing healthier now than he has all season, um, as he, he did get hit by a car. But I don't, I don't know. know. It was, he did. I, he did. Clearly, he fucked that car up. <laughs> um, I don't know how anything – well, I just don't know how anything wasn't broken on his body when he did that. I mean, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. That's how Here, here's that man right there. Here's part two of the Jizzle thing, Aaron, uh, and the, the, the go-to top of the roster scorer. Do you feel like CMOS has done enough – like CMOS and Jizzle – and Dan are good enough to be your like you're still going to want to go get the highest level of talent you can get. But I don't feel as desperate as we did for a top of the roster scoring option nine games ago, right? They won six of their last nine games, and almost all of those games, one or two of those three guys were excellent on the offensive end. Dan is still a, a roller coaster ride. Like, that's going to be the case. But if you roll into the start of next season, offensively, Jizzle, Simas, Dan, and you add a guy that fits somewhere in that mix to create a top four, you feel, I think you have to feel really good about this team turning a corner offensively that they did not turn through the first two thirds of the season. Well, in the last two games, I've been far higher on CMOS than I've been all season. And I think that it's because his shot and they, they smothered him tonight defensively, but he still found ways to get open yeah. because they were more worried about Jizzle James than they were worried about CMOS Lacocious, I think. Uh, I, and I think that yeah. as as Jizzle's offense continues to develop and, and continues to become a problem for any team that they're playing, then you're going to see the offense open up for CMOS. And Dan struggled tonight offensively, and that was kind of, I, I think, probably a little bit of the difference between winning this game and, and what happened tonight. Fair. But, I think that's fair. I feel really good um, there's I, three being at the top next year. And, and who, who you – bank on the score of the points because again to me you you look at that continuity and you know it'll be CMOS and Jizzle's second year Dan's third um doing what what it is West wants him to do and I think he saw a lot of growth throughout the season out of all three of those guys too yeah and that's mm -hmm. why I just feel like there is momentum and if they get the the right mix of guys to come in and and I like the two kids they have as freshmen coming in I just think there's – and, you know, you throw in the red shirt and they've got the makings for a lot of good, young, on-the-upswing talent to uh, make a big difference. I mean, you got to get a little bit figured out inside, but um, I, I feel really good about where they're at right now. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably higher on this team after – even after a loss tonight – going into the off season than I think I was a week ago, a month ago. Um, just knowing what we have now, now that we've, and of course the hand was forced, but knowing that what we have now in Jizzle James as a starter, as a guy who's playing 30 plus minutes a game, um, I've been nothing but impressed over the course of the last two games. But I mean, I think that's the interesting part, right? Is I think our opinions, like, don't play in the NIT, screw the NIT. I think our opinions on this team are a lot different than they were. I mean, and we were oh. trending up, I think, towards the end, like through the Big 12 tournament anyway. But I, I think they... That's, that's why we're so fucking mad about tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, because we were the better team on the court tonight. And I don't know, it... it I think, and we, I think that they probably could have taken the whole thing down if they end up in Indy. Um, right. It would have been interesting. It's going to be interesting to to see how all that shakes out. You saw, uh, you know, what Ohio State did too, and my God, talk about a switch getting flipped on a team. 
Yeah. Uh, I sure as heck didn't see that coming. It lured their athletic department into a terrible hire. So that's going to be interesting. Yeah. I'm wondering <laughs> how it's going to work out. It is crazy. Like, you know, it's, it's, you, you've known this guy how long you knew your other coach. He's a, you know, they went into it when they got rid of Holtman. You know, they went into it thinking they're going outside and they're going to find somebody. And now they got one of these deals and we'll see how that shakes out. But, um, God, I don't know, Chad. That's, you know, there's always a when risk. Is it, a risk. When, like, George, when has that worked? Steve Fisher? Yeah. Um, he did win the tournament that year, but I mean. I mean, he did a little bit more. Like, Diebler won a couple games in the Big Ten, and then you just, like, you, well, you had no, Dusty Fisher's May in your, yeah. you had Dusty Fisher. May in your pocket, but, and you let uh, Dusty May go to Michigan? So you can hire John Diebler? Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, I think Ohio State was hoping, like, we'll let Dusty May go, and he'll end up at Louisville. And uh, now your mistake is going to be staring you in the face every oh, yeah. time. Yeah. Maybe Diebler's going to be a good coach. I don't know. I mean, I know. Yeah, I don't know. He's, know got he's got some good young players. He has a lot of ties in Ohio. Um, I think that is something that was important to their AD, but I just, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that hire. I, I the, the okay. guy's going to. Or you could, even though the, the basketball maybe isn't on the level of, of football nationally, but monetarily and prestige, everything, they, you can pretty much get who you want there. Why couldn't Ohio State, and they have in the past, be doing what Alabama is doing right now with Nate Oates? And Alabama went out and said, we're going to go get a great coach. Right. And he is going to – we're going to give him everything he needs. And Ohio State went on the – I thought they went on the cheap. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I just – they could have gotten a pretty high-level coach there. But I, I oh, hate Ohio I'll, I'll give you a – before we stop talking about Ohio State, I'll give you a beautiful Ohio State anecdote, George. Kelsey came down right before the start of the game. And Ohio State and Georgia are nip and tuck, and there's like 48 seconds left. And Kelsey goes, who are we rooting for? And I said, <laughs> never, ever, Ohio State. And she said, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's I what I thought. It's interesting to explain that to people who aren't from around here, too. When they find out, oh, you're from Cincinnati? How about the Buckeyes? Uh, right. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's always fun on vacation when you're talking to people and they find out you're from Cincinnati and you don't like Ohio State, that you'd rather Michigan win that football game. Right. Explain <laughs> that. <laughs> you got to be from here to know it, I think. Yeah. It's not a place that favors Ohio State very much. No, it's crazy. Like, I, I know at work when all the people would move into town and – think everybody's going to be all Ohio State football, and then they learn differently. It's like, <laughs> no, not everybody in the state thinks that way. It's funny. It's funny. And, you know, you don't have to go very far north where it's pretty rabid, Ohio State right. football. Yep. But that's changed yeah. a lot. That has changed a lot since, you know, the 70s and 80s. Cincinnati started yeah. winning. Yeah. Well, there was no reason to be a fan of Cincinnati football. I know. Time. I I I know. I was stubborn and thought everybody should be. Uh, like ben, cut of your jib, George. Yeah, Ben. Uh, if he leaves, we'll talk about it. But until he leaves, like he Loyola Maryland has not named him as the head coach. So when he if he leaves, if he gets that job, we'll discuss it. Uh, I don't. I generally tend not to uh, like talk about guys leaving until they've left. Chad, you listened to the post game tonight. What was the great quote about Wes's tech that, that he uh about? I'm guessing that was in the post game like media session. I just listened to the WLW the radio, radio gotcha. interview. He didn't have anything there. Uh if he had something, I'm guessing Keegan will, will have the quote. Uh here we go. 
Wes Miller on his technical foul. I was told before I walked in here, it's a $25,000 fine if I talked about officials. I've picked up two technicals this season. One against Houston that I didn't want. I wanted that one. You can read between the lines. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. That's good. That's, that's I give it that one. I give it, it was. One. It was blatant. It should have been a flavor of one. You Go can't on. shove a guy in the back as he's going up for a dunk. Didn't well, make the play on the ball. It's look, dangerous. He couldn't it control like his own. Own. twice to me. He couldn't he, get. He was gonna try for the block, Aaron, but he couldn't. Yeah, he was. He was trying to go. That. He was trying to go vertical. <laughs> he was trying to go vertical. He, he can't go vertical. <laughs> he can't go vertical. No, and I, I get. I get. I mean, if I'm Wes, I would have been fired up and raising hell too. And and you know, it, it's a. It's a shame he got the technical. It shouldn't have come. It shouldn't have happened that way. It shouldn't. Have. But I still think they had their chance. They did. I mean, kudos. Like down nine in that building, screwed right. out the momentum that Indiana that State had, comeback. and to come back and tie it up. That that's some intestinal fortitude. It is, without a doubt. And for the most part, you can point to maybe a couple games this year where you feel like. I, for whatever reason, you know, TCU got out of hand. Um, but, yeah, no, those guys never gave up on anything the entire season. Did they Did they, they actually sell games all the time if they found themselves trailing? So you got to love that about them. And that says a lot about what Wes is doing. Did they actually sell tickets to the Bearcats fan base for that game? And if so, were they just up in the rafters where you could not yeah. see? Section yesterday. I was hoping to go, but hell, um, we could only get any something in the last two rows. That's outrageous. Well, from what so, I understand, they held like they held the tickets for season ticket holders and gave them a chance to buy even more than what they uh have for season tickets, is what I understand. There was a a you could enter Bearcats into the so Indiana State allowed all of their season ticket holders their seats and allowed them to double up. Yeah. And the only way you could get tickets if you were a Cincinnati fan, or if you the only way you could get tickets if you weren't an Indiana State season ticket holder was to go and put Bearcats in at checkout or whatever. And that opened up section 211. Indiana State, here's the fucked up part about that, George. Indiana State didn't relay that to Cincinnati. So Cincinnati had to find that out kind of the hard way. And then they tweeted out or, you know, made on social media said, this is what you have to do to get tickets. And the Indiana State fans went and entered Code Bearcats and bought seats in 211. What a bunch of assholes. Right. Just a bunch of Larry Bird type assholes. So the fact. (laughs) <laughs> the fix was in starting with the tickets. Uh, yeah. But but really, um, getting back to that ticket deal, I thought the NIT had some control over the way tickets are sold, but I guess that's not the case. It's just up to the host school. I, I guess the way that I understand it is um, the NIT, instead of controlling the tickets, has turned it over to each team's uh, – ticketing process right because they already like i guess it's just easier if you let the home team handle what they already like use what they Mm. already have in place to Mm. sell tickets is that Um, what they do for regular home games too they you have to put in a code to get into your section and then you put in the mascot for that team to get those tickets too well basically what happens in the regular season aaron is there's like a block that is sent to cincinnati and cincinnati has months to sell off of that block you don't really i I mean i it should have been here is your block and cincinnati sells it through their yeah uh you know ticketing department or through their donor base or karen hatcher or whoever should be in charge of selling those tickets it should not be a situation where the only way you can get out to your fans what to do 
to buy tickets is to it's put it on media. social media, and then the <laughs> other team steals your goddamn tickets. Well, there's <laughs> you kind of admire that about them too, right? They're having a season they haven't had since Larry Bird was there. Like, exactly. They, Exactly. I ain't mad at him. I'm frustrated because I I thought this team played well enough to win. Um, in spite of it's a great game, Indiana State playing well offensively. George Cincinnati shot fifty percent from the floor and forty five percent from three. I know. I saw that. I saw that. I would have taken a couple more of those this year. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I no kidding. There, that's no doubt. Would have taken that in that last Big 12 tournament game. Sure. But the problem that is. Played fine there until late in the third. Midway through the second half, that's where it got away. I, I would. They just seemed like they were gassed in that game, and they played, what, the two previous days. It just yeah. caught up. They were, out of, they were out of juice. Yeah. The, just, the problem, George, like the problem stat and what you're talking about, ultimately, like the overarching thing, is Indiana State shot 16 of 32 in the second half, 50%, while going one of nine to end the game. Think about they were 15 of that's that's not 20. That is nuts. Yeah. So they were at like 70% until Cincinnati finally started getting stops down the end. But at that time, I mean, they're just a really good offense. I, I know. You know, we, we get frustrated from this end, and we expect Cincinnati to play great defense. That team was just really good on offense, especially the first, you know, 12 minutes of the second half. They were just relentless. Like, they just kept coming. And Cincinnati would push it back to six, and it would be right back to two. Push it back to eight, right back to two. And at some point, you have to, you do have to tip your cap to them and say they made shots. They, they put the pressure on Cincinnati that allowed for the refs to completely fuck Cincinnati over and cost them the game. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do blame the refs in the Texas game this year. I felt like that was a travel at the end of the yeah. game. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't like saying that a whole lot. Um, but, yeah, it is what it is. I hope that on the in, in the off season that Cincinnati can can figure out how to play with a lead because I feel like that's something that they struggled with. They I I would, would have almost felt more comfortable with Cincinnati playing from behind against Indiana State today <laughs> right. than I'll at be, any point playing with a lead. Yeah. I'll be right. Keegan just called me. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, it seems uh, that way, Aaron. It seems like they had difficulty closing games out where they had leads. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're right. When the coin was flipped, it seemed like they were a better comeback team. And, uh, you know, again, after that business happened with the ref and they and they came back from that, they were down nine, got it back to even. Um, you know, it's – it's a team that just flat out did not give up, but you're right. They seem like the, if they have the lead and they did have a, I don't know, seven point lead in the second half, it was fairly early, but that's a game. You, you, you wish they could close it out. It just didn't happen. And I know that big play with, with, with Aziz was, was part of it, but um, you do have to give Indiana state some credit for the way they shot the ball. But they weren't the 76 in uh, What might have been. So if I present you with the question now, knowing what you know now about the way that this game was officiated, do you still take the NIT bid and, and still play knowing that you're going to have shitty refing as opposed to just taking the rest of the season off? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I mean – Play whenever you can play, and pretty much under any circumstances when it's a game situation like that. And you, you know, you don't know how the, you you got an idea how the game's going to be called based on who's roughing and all that. But things happen. It's a fast game. You can't always be right. 
Um, you know, I, I've complained about my share of them, but at the same time, it's not an easy job. And so, yeah, you go out there and you play as hard as you can. You do what you do. And I think Cincinnati found out some things in these three games in the NIT. And I, I found out some things that are going to help them in the future. And I think that's why you do this. And if you are a program that expects to have most of your guys coming back and not fleeing for somewhere else or fleeing for the money, and you can build that continuity, it, it's so much the better. I think it was valuable for them. I agree. Uh, I, I think that we, we certainly found out, especially, obviously, if you don't play, Day Day doesn't get injured. So you don't have a broken foot going into the offseason for him having right. to come back and, <laughs> and rehab through. Um, but you also don't find out what it is to have Jizzle James as a starter. Um, so I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think you, you definitely found out some things about this team. Um, I think they played like they, they belonged. Indiana State looked like they, truthfully, they, they looked like they belonged in the uh, NCAA tournament. Um, yeah, but what I, about I, getting hosed? <laughs> They got hosed. Uh, you're yeah. telling me that team wasn't better than Virginia? Right. Fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> they could beat Virginia 80 to 37. Yeah, they probably <laughs> – they, they certainly, no matter how they play defense, could hold Virginia under 50. Me, you, Aaron, Brent, and Keegan could hold Virginia under 50. At probably. the pace that they play. It, it, exactly. I'm not putting my hat in that ring. <laughs> you better. You're the only one that can play out of that bunch, kid. <laughs> Chad can take Bob. <laughs> Chad, Chad and I are going to be on the bench drinking. I mean, Goodness. yeah, probably. Probably. No, Chad. Chad, I I'd posed the question to George while you were taking the Keegan call. Okay. Um, if you know what you know now about officiating, do you still take the NIT bid? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you allowed um, – the CMOS progression was already happening before you took the NIT bid, but you allowed it to go from, like, blip to – this guy's really fucking good. Like, you allowed it to go from – Yeah, two weeks ago we were – Two weeks ago, we were having the conversation that we didn't have a guy who could score more than 16, 17, 18 points. Those were your, your highs. When, when, when a guy was being a dude on this team, they were right. scoring in the high teens. And now we've had, since the beginning of this tournament, it's really since the beginning of the Big 12 tournament, we've had guys going off for 30 plus, 25, 20 plus on, on, on a regular basis. Right. And that's something we were, we were all begging for throughout the regular season, throughout the Big 12 slate, throughout all of all of the, the tough games. We needed somebody yeah. to be able to, to, to do it, and we hadn't seen anybody really able to do that. And now we've seen some elevation from the guys that we needed to see some elevation from. <laughs> Speaking of, okay, picturing him 35 miles east of Terre Haute, desperately looking for a charging station. <laughs> Joshwin's tweet of the night. Can we star well, that? Let's star that. Great. Yeah, Josh, you're outstanding. That was great. Um, <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's why Keegan called was actually the Jameel tweets. Somebody called him a disappointment, and he said, maybe if I got the ball. And then he deleted it. I, yeah. I mean, I get it. You're frustrated, but come on, kid. Like taking it to social media isn't gonna isn't gonna do anything for anybody. No. Nope. I will say well, that five minute stretch at the end of the first half was fantastic from him. He was defending. He was rebounding. He got a post bucket. He got a three. Yeah. That was. But it came after he was in for a stretch and was terrible. He didn't go over a screen. He didn't help on a on a screen. Like he let a guy beat him for a layup, and West lit into him on the bench. And then he came in and played his most inspired segment of basketball that he had played in a month. And then he really was a non-factor in the second half. So, 
Yeah, about all I remember from the second half is, um, you know, he's bullying his way in, and then he traveled. I don't know if he lost yeah. it. He said he lost his balance. I don't know why. But, he lost his – I mean, he. but he's been bad at that all season when he's backing correct. down. Yep. He doesn't have that. George, you know, guys that are good at that, that is measured. Those dribbles while they're backing you down, they are setting up their footwork. Their footwork isn't sloppy. Right. And he is – we we talked about Aaron. How many times guys are just pulling the the t the chair out from under him, and he's falling down and, and turning it over because he doesn't have good balance when he's making that that strong post move. Right, and it's a darn shame because he's he, he can get himself down there. He just can't finish it because he and he's soft right. when he when he does get it on the rim, George. It's soft, right? Like it's it's impressive, but he just doesn't get it on the rim enough. No, no, he doesn't. Um, it just feels like he's really, really close, but I'm not sure how much better he got at that as the season went on. Yeah. Uh, feels like we've had such a long time since a dude that could back down in the posts. I mean, probably what Gary and Trey. Trey was pretty good at it. Gary was pretty good at it. Kyle, Kyle just hit you with that goofy left handed hook shot. That thing was um, yeah. it was it was the most awkward thing. I've told this story a couple times, George. That year that they played at NKU. Yeah. We were positioned the media seats uh on the baseline, but we were right next to the opposing team's bench. Yeah. And every time Kyle would hit one of those, the assistants from the other team would just be like, How? What? <laughs> We defended it exactly how it was supposed to be defended. Yeah. And that got there, and the ball was in before our guy could even react. Yeah, it, it was uh I, I don't know how he did it. I'd never seen anything like it, but he was darn good at it. And that's you know, that's interesting about the game. I mean, everybody's different, have their different ways. That's what uh God, I'm gonna get way off track here, but it's what I used to, and you still get some of that in golf, but back in the old days before everyone was trained with video and how to swing a club, you had some of the craziest swings on the tour, and now they're all, like, almost the same. Uh, right. there's they all look exactly but, the same. But it, yeah, and it's just that's basketball is not like that at all. Like, there's still all kinds of uh, different ways. You know, we saw it from uh, – from Avila from Indiana State tonight. I mean, you look at that guy and some of the stuff he does, it doesn't really compute, but it but it goes in. Yeah. I, I think the ultimate thing with Jamil on those post moves is his footwork is not where it needs to be. He doesn't play with with balance. And if you're gonna be good backing guys down and getting the ball up on the rim, it's all about footwork, right? Like it's yep. all about your ability to stay balanced and not like leaning or or getting off your you know your center of gravity off point you take it you take two dribbles and you turn and you get it up on the rim not you take it and you're dribbling six times and you're faking this way and you're faking that way and it's too much opportunity for you to lose your base yes. and that's unfortunately what he does Right. I think he gets too excited when he sees a matchup that it's like really like a, a juicy matchup for him. I think he gets too excited, like, oh, I got this, I got this. Right. Aaron. And he's, he's, but that's when you should go slower, not faster, I, right? That's when I, I agree. Yeah, I know I yeah, I agree with what you're saying. He does. He gets too uh, I got it. I got it. I, I'm a, he, he acts like a guard. Uh, like out on the front, like like Jizzle putting you know a couple juke moves on a guy, but he's trying to do it with his back to the basket, and that's not how you that's not how you get the ball softly up on the rim. Yeah, he's trying to get to that spin move, and right, that's where it gets in trouble. NKU was fun. Being a cheerleader was fantastic for back to basketball that year. Jacob Evans buzzer beater into halftime against Houston was electric. The main thing I'll still never, ever, ever forget that last year was um, uh, what's his name from which Greg Marshall's wife and daughter losing their shit 
and being told never come back to Cincinnati. And they they didn't. The rest of the time, they never came back to Cincinnati. Yeah. That, that Probably for good reason. Over there, but it actually worked out. I'll tell you why when we get done with this show, George. I'll tell you why they never came back. To, why it's, it's, a, it's a fun story. Okay. Well, <laughs> to that, hopefully nobody it's, got arrested. No, no, it was all... I'll tell you afterwards. It'll make sense. Undercover? It, it'll make sense. It's a great story. It'll make sense. Uh, <laughs> but uh, do we feel like I think we feel like we felt like coming into the postseason, the Big 12 tournament, and now the NIT, that there weren't enough pieces to get this thing over the top next year in the Big 12. Are we comfortable now with what we've seen from Jizzle, what we've seen from CMOS, what we've seen from Dan, that with another year of development and some additions in the transfer port, they're, they're, they're not going to – Stand pat. Like this roster is not going to look the exact same next year, minus John Newman and Odie. There, there's it's 2024 in college basketball. There's going to be a couple additions. But do we feel comfortable now that the core of this roster is good enough to win more in this league and put themselves in a position where they're not just squeaking into the NCAA tournament, but they're they're waiting on selection Sunday for their seed and they're waiting for their assignment. Or do we still feel like they need one or two more major pieces outside of Jizzle, Day Day, Dan, Simas, Aziz? Uh, you get the Tylers, you get Rayvon, Josh Reed. Like, do we feel like the core is where it needs to be that even without an addition or two? that is top of the roster, they're good enough? Or do we still feel they need to go out and get one or two guys that are going to be, let's say, 20-minute, 20, 20 20-plus 20 minute a night guys? I think we I believe they had to get 20-plus minute a night guys three weeks ago. Do we still I, feel they have to do that? I, I still feel they need at least one of those. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. And and I I also I just feel like um, I still feel like they need something down low offensively. I think they need something more than an option of lobbing it to Aziz. Um, you know, I was hoping Jamil was that guy, and and maybe that can still happen. But I still think they need that guy down there that could get you a bucket. And and I know the games change. But sometimes you still need a guy to just back it down and get it in. And I think that is something that would really come in handy for them in a lot of games. But I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I think they they probably have a little more firepower going into next year than what I thought a month ago. I'd agree. I, th I think you definitely need a, a five that can back somebody down for sure. And no one is surprised to hear me say that. Can it be a four? No, because I think you need a stretch for. Uh, I think that that's and maybe there Betsy are guys is that, that can do both, Aaron. There are guys Bet that can do both. Oh, uh, well, we are we've yet to see guys that have the the arsenal at their disposal to be able to do all of those things. But you're going into the portal, and you're sure. recruiting guys that hopefully, like it, the difference being, like normally five years ago, we would be talking about can you get a high school kid to do that? The answer is no. Can you go into the portal and say, let's find a guy that can not only get us some points in the paint, but is also a 30, like 34, 36% three point shooter? But doesn't everybody want that guy? So sure. I don't know that. I but don't it's know your that job as a coach to go find it and get I, it. I understand. And I think that obviously we've seen here at Cincinnati, if you want to shoot threes, you can, you have a green light, no matter what position you have, <laughs> you are allowed to shoot all the threes. If, <laughs> if you are behind the arc and you decide that you want the ball to leave your hands, make sure it's going at the rim um, because otherwise it's a shitty lob. But anyway, uh, I, I think that you also need at least one more piece because you're, as we saw with day day, you're one injury away, or even with CJ Frederick, you're one injury away from everything changing. And if you don't have 
at least one, if not two. They have dudes. to get a combo guard. They have to get a guard. Yeah. Well, you you can't That's go true. in. You can't go in with just Jizzle and Dayday. Otherwise, you're not right. going to see both of them playing at the you might starting. Need to. You might you're need not going to gonna have yeah. You're not going to have both of them them starting that's that's silly talk if that's your only two dudes that play the point on this roster next season right so i i don't know i i, I think that we know some of this some of the stuff that you need but it's gonna be aaron doesn't ever want all the threes all right aaron gets watching. mad every time they shoot a three I was mad Jamil made it because I wanted to be mad he took the three today. I, I was glad I was glad he took that. And you know why? Because every time he had the ball out top there, that defense was sagged down so low. There were so many times he's standing out there. I'm like, God, I don't want him to shoot it. But at some point, he's going to have to. And thankfully, he made it when he did. You can't just let him. I mean, they were completely – it was like, we dare you to shoot this. Um I was glad he did, and I was even obviously more glad he made it. But sometimes you got to do that, and and you're right; they definitely have the green light to do that if they're wide open and feel good about it. And he felt pretty damn good about it. Yeah. Any anyone, if you want, if you want to shoot threes, come to Cincinnati because you will be allowed to shoot all of the threes. Yeah, and I feel like in the portal, um, I, I you know. They're going to be different guys with different skill sets. But if you get the talent level that they got out of the portal last year with uh, Aziz and, and with CMOS, they'll be cooking. Yeah. If you well, get I mean, that even, kind of a talent level, that's pretty darn good. Those two turned out to be okay. I mean, obviously, he's Aziz is limited offensively, but he still does make a difference on that defensive end. I don't think he got a lot of rebounds tonight, but – but he was all over the place down there. Too many volleyball swats out, especially on the defensive end for my George. taste. But, but you also uh, got Day Day. You also got Day Day, George. Yeah. I mean, th there was. Well, I can. You know why Aziz didn't get many rebounds, George? Because they held his arms like he was in a goddamn straight jacket all night. All right, all right, all right. Are we going to start yelling about that again? <laughs> Oh, that was funny. Um, That's the reason no, we did the I, podcast. I like like you didn't get to have this interaction when you were on TV. No. The podcast, we can, we can talk about this stuff. No, I mean, you got to mix it up and yell at each other every now and then. I mean, Christ, that makes for a boring marriage. T. Win, I, I don't believe that's an elephant in the room. I, I think the writing is on the wall at this point in regards to Vic. Um, I'd be... I don't know what the singing is happening as Chad's frozen, but um, I, I believe yeah. that that Vic is. Uh, <laughs> is play. Am I back? Is your daughter singing in the background? Is no, that what's happening? That, that is not me. That's George. Hold on. <laughs> That's George. That's not me. I'll be back. There's a concert going on in George's other room. It didn't have that on my bingo card for tonight. Look, you played Vic. Did, he played what? Two minutes, three minutes in the entire NIT. If he returned, like, how can how can in what world does a guy play three minutes in three games, and you count on him being part of your core next year, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> should we be concerned by Dan's tweet? Uh, I didn't know what we were talking about either. 13 minutes ago, all he tweeted out was an hourglass. Cryptic. Cryptic tweets. Sure. I, I don't know, man. So did you hear all that? No, I, we heard the singing for a minute. We, oh, you, you, I had the beggar to calm down. I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, <laughs> it's usually the other way around, right? What is going on out there, George? <laughs> so sometimes she just starts cleaning at night, which is fine with me, right? Sure. That but involves... she sings when she cleans? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got no problem with that. 
But what do you know what she was singing? What is her? Oh, yeah, yeah. Here, here's the problem. She can't sing worth a darn, okay? Terrible. And on top of that, she's singing John Denver. Do I really need to be tortured like this? Nothing against John Denver, but that's what's going on. I mean, if, if it was take me home country road, maybe, I don't know, but uh, shine something, whatever his son shines. Well, well makes her happy. An, a, an, an hour after after the game is over, we are in officially in cryptic tweet season. So Yeah, it's, it oh. is portal season, baby. Every quick oh, cryptic yeah. tweet. Like, I don't know, maybe Dan's talking about how long it's going to be until he gets home to his girlfriend. Oh no! Tick, tick tock, mother. <laughs> right. <laughs> or how long before he's back in the gym working towards next year? Right. Yeah, that's, that, that's it, George. That's yeah. certainly it. It's on the clock. I love they, how well, positive I mean, you are tonight. Workouts start soon. Like you got a couple weeks before you, the, the end of the school year that you get to work out. So maybe or he's just excited be, about they, getting there. That he's, you know, until he gets the bag and goes to another school. I don't know. You just never know. <laughs> yeah. You got some real problems there, George. I do. Steve Ross says. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, the truth of the matter is I lost control of this household a long time ago. Long time ago. That's what, like sands through the hourglass. These. So are the days of our lives. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's a loading man. screen reference. That's what it's a loading screen reference for next season. I right. thought he was talking yeah. I thought he I thought he was talking about how much time was wasted in his youth when he should have been playing basketball been playing instead, playing of, organized basketball, instead of yeah. instead of doing whatever else the hell else he was doing. <laughs> Goodness. Well, it's worked out well for him. Fun player to watch. Can be this frustrating been, sometimes, but a fun player to watch. This has been maybe my favorite podcast of the season. My cheeks hurt. I'm laughing so hard during this one. <laughs> well, there's a lot going on. It's a damn shame the basketball season's over here, though. I look it, let, let, out, to, put, but... to put a bow on this because we still there's some reds to talk about, and this is a, a George of the Jungle, George in the Jungle crossover. So we we can't just do the basketball season, but. This was a fun team to watch. It, 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 it was frustrating. Yes. There was a lot of uh, growth. Uh, I think that, you know, we maybe underestimated the growth necessary to uh, assimilate yourself into the Big 12 and the type of games coming from a conference where there were four games a season. Four games in conference play, four out of 18 that you circled and said, we're going to have to really bring it on these four nights. And the other 14 nights, we're going to be more talented than the opponent. Uh, even in a downturn, we're going to be more talented than, than the opponent. And if we just play reasonably well, we're going to win. They Did they win all those games? No. But that's playing in the American Athletic Conference. And going to the Big 12 was a larger step than probably any of us really, even though we talked about it and we said we realized it and we said we understood the jump that was about to occur. It was bigger than we thought. This league was, I thought it was the best basketball league in the country coming in. It was better than that. The talent on the rosters, top to bottom. There, there was very rarely a situation where you looked at a team and you said, go at that guy, or if you just do this, you're going to be able to win. Because they all had dudes. They all had guys that could put the ball in the basket. They all had long athletes. They had rim protection. The, the coaching is stellar in this league. And there were bumps in the road and there were learning curves that, that this team is going to have to, you know, I think the main learning curve, and I'm sure we'll talk about this ad nauseum in the off season, 
the main learning curve was, yet you have to bring it for Kansas and Baylor and, and Texas and da 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 But if you slack off against Oklahoma State or you take your foot off the gas down the stretch against West Virginia, you're going to lose. And that wasn't the case for a decade because the teams just weren't good enough to beat you. And here they are. And I thought there was a giant learning curve that this program did a great job adjusting to as things uh, played out. But they have to be better next year. And they have to be in a situation where you're not swimming upstream in late February. It can't be we have to win four of our last seven, but four of our last six to be comfortable about making the tournament. It has to be <clears throat> we're playing from a position of strength. And if we win three of our next four or three of our next five or whatever, we're going to be a protected seed. Right. And I, I, I'm i excited about the progress that we saw. But also mindful of, you know what there's going to be a lot of next year, George? It's going to be a lot of one possession games with four minutes on the clock. Right. That ain't going that. away. No, Don't it's do that. not. Um, you know, and it's good that they got a, a, a taste of a lot of those this season. I mean, that's, you know, as long as you get to carry over with the players who went through that and understand what it takes, they're going to be that much better for it. And when you look at those big 12 games and how good those teams were night in and night out and the, and, and the amount of talent you face night in and night out, there were only a couple of really disappointing games. The Oklahoma State game at home, of course. Um, West Virginia. You know, they did not play well against Iowa State, but a lot of that was Iowa State and their defense. I mean, they it's just really fun they were unbelievable that night <laughs> defensively. They really were. Jeez. Looking back, George, TCU might be the most mind-boggling because they were a disaster down the stretch, except for that game. Right, that game, everything worked for them. It was a it was a blowout, and 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 that was a disappointment on UC's end. And then yeah, the other that one was was blowing that lead at West Virginia. That's three of the Big Twelve games. Two of them were like, "What the hell is this?" That was TCU on the road, Oklahoma State at home. Uh, West still Virginia, give you it just. I, I can't explain it, but um, if they weren't blown out, they should have won. I'll still give you Xavier because the crosstown shootout still. It, it's oh yeah, but I, 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 yeah, I, I said Big Twelve games, but yeah, that uh, um, actually Dayton and Xavier both uh, kind of disappointed me. But Dayton was much better than I gave him credit yeah. for at the time. Yeah, much better. But I just felt like that was a game they let get away. They didn't let many games get away. Don't forget we get Arizona, Utah, and Colorado next year. Graybush, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is conference goes from 20. 18 to 20. 20. So now to go 500, you got to win 10 times in the Big 12. <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. About that. Fuck you. Do you got to win 10 games to go 500 in this league? Well, <laughs> that's how, a big how many home, conference. How, how many home games they win this year? Four. Uh they were four and five, I think. Yeah. Or, Wolf. No, I think did they get to five and four? Regardless, you got to figure out how to win at home. Start yeah. there. For sure. Yeah. Again, guess what? All the good teams in this league. We talked about it, Aaron, in the middle of the season. Win at home. Houston, Iowa State, Kansas, and Baylor were they had like one loss. They were like 17 and one at home. Um, and Cincinnati was like two and four at that point in time. They had lost quadruple the number of games at home than the top four teams. And that's that might be the biggest thing going into next year, guys. They Win didn't beat home. Houston, they didn't beat Iowa State in the regular season, they didn't beat Kansas, they didn't beat Baylor. When you look at where they were, they did beat Texas Tech, who finished fourth because Kansas kind of fell. But in the regular season, they had one win against the top, the teams that ended up in the top four in the league. 
if you're going to get into the tournament comfortably, you got to beat those top teams two, three. Like you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to have a winning record unless you're one of the best teams. You're not going to have a winning record against those teams. But you can't be one in five, one in six, or whatever, because you're never going to get into the tournament. That, or, and can't. if you do, you're going to be a ten seed or whatever. You also can't be right around five hundred at home. You have, right. to figure that's figure right. out. but that's part of it, Aaron. You have to right. get though a couple of those teams at home when they right. come to your place. You can't just lay over, like roll over, and let them rub your belly. Right. You got to beat a couple of them. Yeah, that's that's how you get above. But I think that's what I was getting at, Aaron. That I didn't probably communicate as well. In order to be where you're talking about in that home record, you have to beat a couple of those teams at home. Even if not, even if you're dropping to a couple of those teams, say you finish seven and three, eight and two, you're going to catch someone slipping on the road at some point in time and sure, be able but, to get to ten with with winning seven but, or eight at home. But yeah, but you're talking about being, overall point being a higher seed, being a team yeah. that's comfortably yeah. in the tournament. You can't do that without winning any of the big games. Yeah, You've got to win a couple of those things. And how do you do that, Aaron? You don't do it at their place because they don't lose at home. you got to do it at your place. And, and you got to make your place, again, one of the toughest environments. Look, this fan base was fucking incredible at home this season. I agree with Fucking that. Incredible. Their job. Game in, game and, out. And Cincinnati lost too many games down the stretch at the buzzer. However you want, like, whatever. You've got to win those games because it makes everything else easier. It's it's the swimming upstream in February that we keep talking about. The, the way that you're not swimming upstream in February is you hold serve at home, and then you go get a couple on the road. And now you're playing above the water instead of – Trying to get get out of quicksand. I agree with you. I just think I said it poorly, Aaron. All good. Yeah, and I mean, well, even this year, if you take care of the Texas game at home and Oklahoma at home, that makes a big difference. Sure. Makes a huge difference. Well, they could have started. You remember we talked all, uh, at nauseum about that, that first six-game stretch, George. Right. They could have been four and two. Correct. And And – you know, They're right there. And instead, you're two and four, and you feel good because you played well, but over an 18 game conference schedule, that two and four, if it was four and two, you you would have been playing from ahead of the curve, I guess. Correct. Absolutely. Well, any any other last thoughts before we Put the bow on this 23-24 basketball season. I wish I enjoyed that game more for the basketball. I really do. I, I, I wish I wish that it was officiated to the point that I really got to enjoy a good game between two teams. And instead of one, wondering if was. instead of wondering if we just got Shohei Otanied. Right. <laughs> Right. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, that's all. Like, I, I just wish that I had a chance to better appreciate what was ultimately a really well-played game. I apparently enjoyed it too much. I thought it was a hell of a game. Um, didn't like the outcome, but um, it was entertaining. And, and I said that about a lot of games this year. You know, um, I'm fairly easy to entertain, but this season was very entertaining. Even the the close losses. Um, there, there was, a, let's put it this way: it tested the old ticker, night in and night out. It was crazy. What What do the kids say, Aaron? That that this whole season had no chill. No, there's no chill Zero. in any of this season. <laughs> Zero, Zero chill. It was it was. My puppy, aged like five years, listening to me and Kelsey yell at the TV on road games. Yeah, it was crazy. It was a lot of fun. I feel like they, I feel like they used to say no chill. I feel like there's probably a new term for that at this no, point. No, is it I, no I, cap? Did no cap take over no chill? 
well, no cap is when you're talking about is it true or not? I don't. What are, what are you doing right now? You're, how do you do, fellow kids? What do you What are you doing right now? <laughs> I'm being or I'm doing a poor job of being funny. You You are You are dadding it up. In any case, um, switching gears an hour and 20 minutes into this thing, uh, George and I are going to do what you can catch George and I doing every Tuesday night here at 9, um, obviously a little later here due to the after game. Uh, there's nothing really to talk about in movement for the Bengals, so I don't think we're going to waste any time in that discussion before we get out of here, but uh, did want to present some things on the Cincinnati Reds as – we are what uh, at this point thirty six hours from roughly yeah <laughs> roughly thirty six hours from from opening Four. pitch forty yeah. hours oh uh, thirty six forty hours maybe forty hours so still being decimated by injuries um they 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 did yeah. make a move. A small trade with the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, an odd yeah, trade. They needed an infielder after all that talk in the offseason. After, after they the, needed a backup utility infielder. And they got after one. after the glut of infielders that they had just I, three months ago. Uh, you, you certainly did not have a glut of infielders. Makes you almost wish they had held on to Barrero, who it did make the Texas Rangers uh, opening day roster. He, he had been informed. Um, but this this team, I'm, I'm far less excited about this team getting ready here in, in just over a day than I was a month ago. But baseball is about to be upon us. I've already been playing my way through my road to the show on MLB The Show. Um, but what are you excited about for this opening day, George? Oh, my gosh. Number one, well, I love watching these guys play, and I know they don't have their full complement, um, but it was an exciting team to watch last year. You know, you're you're missing Matt McClain, T.J. Friedel. Obviously, you no, know, L.V. Marte is not going to be playing third base for a while, but outside of that, they're still in fair shape. Um, I, I just hope that they can hold on and, and, you know, get these guys back, Friedel and McLean for sure. And they can just keep, you know, tread water and stay as close as they can. And once they get those horses back, they can make their run, but they got to keep it within reason. I think they can, um, you, you pray to God, the pitching holds up and the young pitching finally starts getting some consistency, um, you know, some of them need a game to game. Some, like Hunter Green, need an inning to inning. He'll go out and dominate two innings, then get whacked around uh, for two or three home runs in an inning. It's crazy. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited still about this season because I, I just love the upside of this team. I think this, this division is there for the taking. Um, but – these injuries have just been – it's been a kick to the gut, really, this whole spring training and how these injuries have shaken out. But thankfully, um, you still got a guy like Jonathan India that can start the season at second base for him. Uh, because, right. you, you know, you're, you're thinking last year they got to get rid of this guy and why are they hanging on to him and all this. And here he is probably leading off and playing second base to begin the season and – I'm thankful they have him to do that. So I, I think they're going to be all right. I still think they can uh, make noise and win this division. Uh, I don't know how many wins it's going to take to win the division. 88 might get it done. Um, and I think they can do that. I, I think they can still – I'm still bullish on the Reds. They are opening up their season against the Washington Nationals. They are currently um, – favorites in that game as Frankie Montas will be uh, pitching against Josiah Gray, who is a former red. Well, not red, I guess he just in the organization himself. Yeah, they drafted him. Uh, also on that team, Jesse Winker is yep. looking to be your, your left fielder. Uh, 
Nick Senzel is apparently made the move back into the infield. Uh, it looks to be, at least in the last game they played, he, he played third base, started yeah, at third base for them. Yeah, supposed to start at third base Thursday. But uh, just just funny to see some some old faces, I guess. As, as you know, you and I'll say this against Senzel. I felt like last year when he played at third base and they had to play him there for a little bit, I think it was in May or towards the end of May, it was early. He played well there, and and I thought he he was better at the plate when he was playing third base. I don't know. I don't know if he's just comfortable there. He, you know, that was where he was in college. I don't know what it is, but we'll see how he does. I mean, I'm glad the Reds have who they have, and, and I, I wish the best for him. But it was definitely time to move on from him. It just never worked out here. But third base might be his place. Um, and then you know. Josiah Gray, he was in that Dodgers deal that brought Pete uh, Puig and and Kemp and who else was in it? Oh. Alex Wood and Kyle Farmer. Yeah, yeah with Gray, <laughs> uh, a, a minor league shortstop, Jeter Downs and Homer Bailey. The Reds traded the Dodgers for all that, and and who would have thought at the time it looked like Kyle Farmer was like the throw in, but he was the best Reds player out of that trade. Absolutely. Well, you could. Some of us still hold nostalgic memories for what Yasiel Puig did in his short right. time here before before he got into all the trouble that he oh, ended up right. getting into. Right, right. But yeah, so uh, yeah, they got a Reds flavor on that roster. But uh, yeah, hopefully the Reds are primed, ready to go, and hopefully that pitching will hold up. Uh, they they've got enough of them, but again, injuries are kind of messing with that a little bit you know Lodolo not starting until april 10th i think is the last i saw uh where they planned on him being ready but with that which is plenty early enough i just hope that whatever that stress reaction thing is he's been having in that leg i, I hope he's finally past that hopefully uh you know hunter can get himself consistent during each outing and uh, Abbott and Ashcraft can bounce back where they are. Frankie Montas holds up. Early on, who are you most excited to be watching on this roster? Well, if you say anyone but Ellie De La Cruz, you're, you're freaking lying because the guy can do anything and everything, and, and he's absolutely – you have to watch every at-bat, every time he's on the base. Um, you, you just – you can't turn your back on that guy. Uh, I'm excited to watch him play all day, every day. I'm also excited to see, or excite, curious to see how this outfield rotation works. Um, you know, it looks like it's going to be a, a Fairchild, Benson kind of platoon deal in center field with Fraley and, and Steer playing the corners. Um, and, and hopefully that works out for them until Friedel gets back. Uh, the early signs on Friedel are positive that he may be able to return fairly quickly from this wrist fracture. But, um, you know, I'm excited about uh, seeing how they do and see if they can fill that void because Benson certainly flashed some serious, serious long-term potential last year. Yeah, I'd be lying if I said I was not excited about Ellie De La Cruz. Uh, number one, first and foremost, I think that's a given for anybody who's a fan of this team. Um, number two for me is probably Spencer Steer. Uh, just excited to see if he can build a, on his season last year and see what that looks like now that he, at, at least early on, looks to be in a fairly regular spot in left field. Um, I, I wouldn't imagine they're going to play him a ton at first base at early on uh, with some of the options that they have available at, at that first base spot. Um, and I'm with with fake John Goble here in the chat. CES, Christian Encarnacion Strand, uh, I'm actually really excited to see him play and see if yeah, he, he's an interesting I, player no doubt he can beat the shit out of the ball right and i i don't know i'm i'm probably more bullish on those two guys um in their sophomore seasons than i than i was even last season on, on those two guys and they both put together pretty good seasons in their rookie seasons so yeah they certainly look like they belong at this level no doubt about I, it I'm also excited to see what uh, what Abbott can do after the season he put together last year. He was fantastic. Um, he's probably 
outside of Hunter Green, the pitcher that I'm most excited about, followed up shortly thereafter by by Graham Ashcraft, uh, because he had he was a bulldog last year. He was, I think, the only pitcher who didn't get injured um, at any point in time. And well, last year he did get injured. That comebacker that got him on the shin. Do you remember that? Okay, so not a not a muscle injury. Maybe that's why I'm remembering it differently. Yeah, it was, no, that he was. Yeah, he was out a little longer than I thought he would be, and I so jinxed him that game. I still feel bad about that. <laughs> what did you do? Well, I got to the game, and it was the top of the second inning. I was running behind, and he mowed through the first inning, one, two, three, retired the first guy in the second inning, and I sit down and tell the guys I'm joining. I'm like, well, looks like we got the good Ashcraft. This is great. And my buddy goes, it's awfully early. Right then, a comebacker hits him on the shin, and I'm like, ah, he'll be okay. He stayed in the game. The next three guys got on base, got hits. He may have walked a guy. Anyway, he leaves the game after that, and he wasn't seen for like a month. So I felt like I jinxed him. I feel like you need to go to games with people who are more positive about the teams that they're there to watch. (laughs) Every. Conversation. I know, I know. It's like, <laughs> and he's like, hey, look, we're only one out into the second inning. Take it easy. And then whack. And it, oh, it just, man. Uh, oh, my God. It was, it was bad. So, yeah, I, I jinxed him really, really good. Here's the thing that I think, like, is, is going to be the telltale sign of this Reds. Like, it's going to define this Reds team. They are maxed out right now. On what they can, I hear she's she's humming away. She's, Take she's her home, again. country roads, <laughs> to a place I belong, West Virginia, Mount I Mama. Denver. Um, can they stay healthy for a month? If they can stay healthy for a month, I think they have enough to weather the storm. But if you have another injury or two, or two right out of the gate, the depth is not there. And then we're back to the frustration of last year, Kevin Newman and Stuart Fairchild, who was apparent, probably going to be the starting center fielder for this team for the first month. Like, you're already – I hope it's Ben. They're testing the depth, that's for sure. It's test. Yeah. Well, Aaron, if it's Benson, who plays right? And and Fraley. Fraley. Who plays left? Steer. Steer. Okay. Now you are completely maxed out. There is no depth on your team at all. If that's your your starting outfield, and you have nobody then to, to – so you need all eight guys. Essentially, at this point, maybe you have a little bit of depth at catcher with Maley and and Stevenson or whatever – But you don't have depth at first. You don't have depth at second. You don't have depth at short. You don't have depth at third. You have three outfielders, essentially, with nobody that's that's a plus major league player behind them. If you can get through a month healthy and you start to see some of these guys come back, like, George, what would you – if they can go two games under 500 in April – I feel really good. Yeah, they just need to stay in the mix until they get these guys back, and that's not going to be easy. Like you said, if they suffer another injury, I mean, you don't even have Edwin Arroyo around in the minors now. To bring, you know, he's injured now for the year. I, I Maybe Aaron, maybe George, I am scarred by seeing this team go 3-14 and, and 14 to start the season. Three and twenty-two. Three and twenty-two. I wasn't. I was trying to take like. I was trying to take the outliers out and just go with. We've all seen it. I know, but that's my point. Like they are at a point now where they are, they are so thin that a terrible April is not something that would surprise anybody. And the starting pitching didn't do anything through the last half of spring training to make anybody feel like. The starters were going to, the the pitching was going to be able to carry them through April. So 
even the guys yeah. that you, even the guys that you signed to these expensive contracts with Montas right. and, and Martinez. Um, I'm wondering. I, I brought this up in a conversation with a friend. I'm wondering if maybe they should have just not spent the money on two dudes and put that money towards a Blake Snell who signed super cheap. Sure. I mean, yeah, that's that's always going to be the question of this offseason is that they didn't go out and get a one. Like, I, maybe Frankie Montas will be good, but I don't think we're going to be sitting here talking. And I think the chances are uh, there's a better chance that Aziz Bandego shoots 34% from three next year than there is us talking about Frankie Montas as like a, a dominant Oscar? starting pitcher in July. Uh, right. I mean, he said one inning or two innings last year. Um, and you hope they brought you in a three and, 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 you know, okay, but you better hope uh, Hunter Green is a one and somebody's a two. Because if you're counting on Frankie Montas to be your one, you guys are going to have a lot of bad, tough, difficult conversations at nine o'clock on Tuesday nights from here until September. Right, you got to cross your fingers on Lodolo too that he's going to be healthy and be able to hold up. I don't know sure. what this lingering issue has been, but it seems crazy. But yeah, that's a that's a valid big total concern that could tell the season, given you know what happens early in the season. You'd like to think, and you can't think this way, especially with the Reds, that they've had their bad luck. It just seems like it just follows them around, man. They can't get a break. They go in loaded, and we're talking about, and we were just talking about this when you were gone. You go into the off season, it's like, well, India probably won't be around. Barrera, it's a good thing they kept India. Yeah. Yep. Oh, they well, George, they would be royally screwed if Jonathan India wasn't on this team right now. I know, and and everyone wanted to ship him off, and he's right. going to be starting second baseman and leading off on Thursday. And yeah, I'm I'm glad they have him. I'm glad they have him. You also have to hope. You also have to hope that Jaime Candelario can give you something because so far through spring training, he has given you nothing. Nothing. No, his, if each his of us is good. If each of us got one hit in spring training, we would have one less hit than Jamie or Candelario this spring. I don't think I would have gotten a hit in spring training, to be honest. I'm I just saying if you best day if I would have. If you lucked into one. Right. All right, like sometimes in baseball, you hit a little flare uh, 96 feet over the third baseman's head. Guarantee I would have gotten my swings in because I swung at anything. You still, the left fielder still might have thrown you out at first. Well, that's true. That's, <laughs> uh, I remember those little league days when that would happen. Sometimes you just got to throw the bat out there and hope that it hits right. the ball. Right. <laughs> but oh, yeah, no. we are on the Reds, and I'm going to say 88 wins and a division title. Can they do it with 88? No. We with need this, 90. You think there's a 90 win team in this division? I know this division's not that great. I'm not sure there's I'm, a 90 win team. I'm not sure that they can actually beat the Pirates in the season long series. And, and well, I, no, I, you're not answering its question. Well, if they was, get to 88 here, wins, is that enough to win the division? That's his question. Out. The problem is that they they can't beat the teams that they are supposed to beat when they play them in season that one is, series. So I'm getting that's part of my point is the fact they're not going to get to 88 wins. 88 wins is is I don't think 88 win. I, I think you have to have 90 plus to win the division. Okay, and I don't think. That, this Who in this division there. wins 90 games? It's probably fucking St. Louis because it's always fucking St. Louis. Dude, they are they are in worse shape than the Reds right now. You want to talk about injuries? Des like they are. I think I saw today, George. They have three outfielders going into opening day. Three. We, we have four. I, I feel sorry for them, but I can't. We, we, we have four. No, they're more. But my point being, we're talking about the Reds being decimated. They are more decimated by injuries uh, pretty clearly. I, My only point, Aaron, and the reason I'm focused on this, this division's not good. Like, Milwaukee is not going to do what no. Milwaukee did last year 
where they just they hit that surge and became a 95 win team. I don't know that there's anybody in this division that's capable of that. I think that's what frustrates. I think that's what frustrates me the most about how the Reds spent sure. the money this offseason is because you had it was there for the taking. You you had St. Louis who didn't spend a ton of money. You had Chicago who spent even less sure. money. You had I Milwaukee agree. that didn't spend a ton of money, and Pittsburgh will no, never spend Milwaukee, money. Milwaukee purposely. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like I don't I don't understand why you wouldn't hop on granted it's not a 60 game sprint for the the sure if you will but you you have an opportunity to win this handily if you just spent the money and i i don't i don't love how they spent the money this offseason truthfully um i don't either i think you're right i i agree with that I, i don't think it changes the question that george asked if they if this is a team that gets to 88 wins they probably I, I just don't I don't think there's a 90 win team in this division. I, I really don't. I don't think it's good. Oh it's always St. Louis. And I, I until it's not St. Louis for a handful of years, it's always going to be St. Louis. It wasn't them last year. They were terrible. They, they got they got Sonny Gray and his weird Twitter likes this year. So and he's on the DL, right? Isn't he on the DL already? The IL? Yeah, I think he's hurt. Does he have they don't have any outfielders. They're thin in the infield. Their pitching stinks. Like, I get it, Aaron. I'm a, I'm like it's a it's a Stockholm syndrome, right? With the Cardinals. Well, it's the same way with the Bengals and, and the Steelers. And the Steelers, right? Like mm-hmm. we just expect, but but when you look at the Cardinals right now, they're that is not a good the, the Cardinal way. Uh, he, did, he did pull his his hamstring uh, four days ago. Sonny Gray did. Yeah, I, th- I thought I remembered seeing that. Like, yeah, I don't think he's starting the season. No, uh, I, he's on the injured list. So, spending well, we million we're going to have a fun summer there, Aaron. Talking about be... 88 wins, baby, and if that's enough. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll have to find <laughs> out if, if you, you and I predict- being partners. So I predicted last year they would lose 100. So that's how good I am at predicting stuff. <laughs> Oh, I I took I took the over on their wins last year and and I hit easy well before. Yeah. I think it was sixty five and a half. I think was the yeah, it was over really last year. Yeah, my buddy, my buddy, my best friend Al took the same thing and he was he was dancing in like August. Yeah, 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 exactly. So he's Damn. like, I should have put way more money on that. Yeah, <laughs> you taking the over this year. Um, I, I think it's at what eighty seventy nine. No, I think it's on. Isn't it under eighty? I have to check. I think it's seventy-eight, seventy-nine. Win. I think it's under eighty. I'll have an update on that next week. Well, if I, I will if, put I, if I took some it, some of my money where my mouth is, and go in and bet that. Yeah, a lot. You got eighty-eight. Like you could tease that bad boy. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Tease it. Tease it. You got to at least tease it to like eighty-two and a half, right? Like. Or eighty-one and a half that they're gonna they're gonna break five hundred. I'd be better off and eighty playing those. Is it Jaden Porter? I'd be better off playing his unders in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> well, pl- that's a good joke. That's a that's a good <laughs> joke, George. Well, I'll tell you what, that's ugly and obvious. In any case, um, we will have Reds updates for you next week. Um, there will have been at that point four games played, I believe, um, with the fifth underway or maybe over by the time we record next week. So, um, I think that's gonna, unless you want to talk anything, FC Cincinnati or oh, local coming off a win, they'll be fine this year. Don't have to worry about them a whole lot, but yeah, yeah, there's there's starting to make me money i i appreciate them on that in that regard. Goal, they'll be fine yep well that's gonna wrap it up then for another episode of george in the jungle thanks to Galactic fried chicken for sponsoring the crossover and thanks as always to remington tavern for sponsoring george and i Again, you can check them out at 8892 Glendale Milford Road, 45140, where they have daily happy hour from 3 to 7 p.m., $5 whip for Wednesdays. Check them out on Instagram at Remy Tav Cincy or follow them on Facebook. 
But until 9 o'clock next Tuesday, for George Vogel, thanks to Chad for joining us. I'm Aaron Smith. We'll see you next Tuesday.